And never before has there been so many resources available. Uh, and the community itself, the community, this themed entertainment community is really open and has really uh, reached out to talk with students, to encourage people, to to help in, in ways that I, I never even thought possible. So I've been blown away. Welcome to Obsessed Show, a podcast that is designed to inspire, featuring some of the most creative people in the world. I'm your host, Josh Miles. Let's talk about today's episode. Today on Obsessed Show, we have a different episode. My friends Josh Polk and Chris Rogers from the IUPUI themed entertainment design group are going to be interviewing a few big names in the themed entertainment design space, including folks with some background working with a certain mouse. So if you're curious or interested about theme design, this is definitely an episode for you. What's interesting is we tried to get this to work with all six of us on the same line. And you can imagine with all the screwy schedules, strangely, I was the one who got kicked out, (laughs) which I was totally fine with. Uh, And Josh and Chris do a great job of interviewing our three guests. They're on skis, Nate Naverson and Jason Sorrell. So without further ado, please enjoy this guest recorded episode of Obsessed Show featuring Josh, Chris, Jason, Nate, and Theron. Enjoy. Well, hello everyone. My name is Chris Rogers. Um, I am a professor in computer graphics technology at IUPUI in Indianapolis, and I teach courses in themed entertainment design. And uh, let me start by saying, first of all, that I'm really thankful to Josh Miles for allowing us to hijack this podcast for today, Obsessed Show, to bring you all the world of themed entertainment. And uh, I'm going to let my my co-host, uh, Josh, introduced himself. Hi, my name is Josh Polk, and I'm a lecturer um, in computer graphics technology as well, teaching interactive multimedia, and I've taught one of the themed entertainment classes as well. And we're really excited to, to talk to our guests today, and uh, it's great to be here. And we have three amazing guests today uh, from the world of themed entertainment, which is really far and vast and wide, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. So with us today, uh, and I'll go, I'm I'm on Zoom right now, so I'm going to go from my left to my right, uh, is Theron Skis. Theron is a veteran Disney Imagineer and founder of Designers Creative Studio. Uh, Nate Naverson is the founder of themedattraction.com and uh, has a, a wonderful career in work doing work for Universal Creative, uh, as well as he's a pilot and uh, I think uh, he's owned a smoothie shop. And I think you, you maybe you were a gymnast or something like that, too. I'm wow. I'm, I'm getting Not a gymnast. So, Not a gymnast. oh. I knew I knew you've had a lot of different careers, right? So, and then Jason Searle. Jason is a, a show writer and creative writer for Walt Disney Imagination, currently with Storyland Studios. And he has a, a wonderful collection of books that he has authored, uh, which has really helped to feed the education of the industry. So thanks to each of you for joining us today. Thanks for having us. Thank Good you. Good to be here. Yeah. So starting out, you know, I, I'm going to kind of open up the floor. I would love to kind of hear a little bit more about each of your current roles. Uh, and then also, did you know, what what led you up to that point? What was your background that actually got you to the place where you are right now? And I know you got to do that like in a short period of time, but give us a kind of a quick recap. So Jason, you want to go first? You're, you're sure. active. So yeah, sure. Uh, Well, I'm currently an executive creative director at Storyland Studios, uh, which I'm really excited to be a part of. Uh, I started out actually in live entertainment while I was still in college, and that was what sort of started my journey. I actually, my first job was as a Jungle Cruise skipper on the Walt Disney World College program. So it's a a really fun uh, first industry job to have and kind of an iconic first uh, Disney job to have. Um, But my background in entertainment actually was what got me into the creative side of the business in general. Uh, I began as a writer and director of live live entertainment, first at Disney, then at Universal, then eventually back at Disney again. Uh, But I pretty much wrote and directed any and every kind of live entertainment you can think of, Uh, you know, from the stunt shows to musicals, fireworks, spectaculars, press events, uh, 
educational programming for children, uh, it, pretty much anything and everything under the sun in live entertainment. Uh, and then ultimately made the transition over to the attraction side, starting with Islands of Adventure. I was the show writer for Jurassic Park, uh, the land at Islands of Adventure. And that was what gave me the sort of e-ticket experience, if you will, to make the jump uh, back to Disney, to Walt Disney Imagineering, where I spent 15 years as a writer, producer, and creative director. Uh, I worked on um, things like Star Tours, The Adventures Continue, Monsters Incorporated Laugh Floor, on the entertainment side, American Idol Experience, Star Wars Weekends, did a lot of work for Disney Cruise Line, Disney Vacation Club. Uh, actually, here in Florida, we, we uh, came up with the concept for what would become New Fantasyland at the Magic Kingdom, including the Seven Dwarfs Mine Train and uh, kind of a new approach to character meet and greets, which you see with uh, Enchanted Tales with Belle. Uh, through enhancements and additions, I was able to contribute to classics like Pirates of the Caribbean and the Haunted Mansion. So that was an incredible thrill for me. Uh, and then I ended my time at Imagineering uh, by spending a year in Glendale working on uh, the, the predecessor to Star Wars Galaxy's Edge. I worked on a couple of earlier incarnations of a Star Wars land. And then it was at that time that I made the jump to Universal Creative because they uh, offered me the opportunity to sort of graduate from show writing into creative direction. So in my six years there, I was the creative director for Race Through New York, starring Jimmy Fallon. Because when you think of late night talk shows, you think thrill ride. So you're welcome, Great. America. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, uh, my my big, uh, uh, I think, opportunity there was uh, the being the creative director for Universal Studios Beijing. So literally within a year, I had the opportunity to creative direct a whole park, which uh, was an unbelievable gift and opportunity there. And that's going to open, God willing, in just a couple of short months. And then I spent about a year and a half as creative director of Epic Universe, which was just turned back on, thank goodness, which is great news for the industry and great news for Orlando. Uh, and I was creative director of that part from sort of the earliest days of ideation into concept, at which point I went back to the creative studio where I spent a few more years, a couple more years until, uh, I don't know if you heard, there was a great deal of unrest in our industry last year, uh, some sort of flu bug. Uh, sort of upended everything. That's what we're calling it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, so, and, and that's when a lot of us, uh, Theron and myself included, were sort of released into the wild. Um, and so I did a couple months of freelance work, but ultimately landed with Storyland Studios as an executive creative director. Uh, and I'm work currently working on three of their major theme park level projects. So it's been quite a journey. That's why I look the way I look with the bags under the eyes and no hair. <laughs> uh, but it's been quite a ride, uh, no pun intended. And along the way, I got to meet Theron, uh, and he's been one of my all-time favorite collaborate collaborators. We spent uh, probably almost 10 years together at Walt Disney Imagineering uh, with a lot of projects centered at Disney MGM Studios, now Disney's Hollywood Studios. So it's a pleasure to be here with uh, with my old pal and collaborator. That would be a whole nother show uh, <laughs> just, uh, for sure. But uh, and people would probably tune into that one. There's some great we behind the scenes. Herbie the love bug. One exactly. Time. <laughs> Stay the tuned. People. Of, to the delight of the back lot to our tram. Guests. <laughs> it's uh, I'll add on to that. Um, Jason's actually published some really cool books, too. I actually um, ordered this one about the Haunted Mansion for Christmas that I really enjoyed. There's some awesome visuals and story in there. Yeah, I, oh, yeah, I, I guess I forgot about it. You're an author, too, Jason. <laughs> During my time, it, it, it's, wow, it really has been a, a, a disruptive year. Uh, and during that 15 years at Imagineering, I, I did have the opportunity to uh, write and publish some books on the art of theme design, the making of some of the classic attractions. Uh, I also did a, a book on story and screenwriting as seen through the eyes of the Disney animated films, uh, which was a lot of fun. And then ultimately, it got to do the art of Marvel's Avengers, which was uh, the thrill of a lifetime. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Being on that set and interviewing uh, all of those folks. Uh, and I thought, you know what? These Marvel people are on to something. I, th I think they're going to go on to <laughs> some big things. This Kevin Feige, I don't know if you've heard of him. Got his stuff together. Yeah, he's this kid's going places. <laughs> so Jason... Um, has already done a really good introduction there, uh, at least a little bit of Theron. So why don't we go on to Theron? Theron, tell us a little bit again about your background. Certainly. Um, I'm one of those uh, 
professionals that stumbled into Imagineering. Um, and I didn't actually even know to be sad about that until many years after meeting so many fans of Imagineering and um, knowing that they had you know, thousands of resumes on file and I sort of just stumbled into it. Um, I was uh, initially working in film and television in a what was at the time a pretty new industry in Orlando and uh, made the switch by being invited to Paris to work on the, the original park there. At the time, I was into really big scale uh, sculpture. So I got in and I had done a job at Universal Studios Base Park where I did all, all the artificial rock work around the lagoon and worked inside of E.T. And um, uh, the one of the people that I worked with on that project, and I think it was before either one of us had worked for Disney, was a gentleman named Jolt Horme. Uh, so f fans out there would know Jolt as uh, sort of the you know, consummate sculptor of our time, uh, pretty much everything at Disney of any size or scale, uh, Tree of Life, the Caldera in Tokyo, um, you know, the Cadillac Range at uh, DCA in California, all of these iconic sculptures are, are, you know, were he was a part of, he directed. So he invited me to Paris. I got to work, uh, as Jason said, in Pirates of the Caribbean. I did all of the rock work uh, inside and outside of that whole attraction, worked with the team there. And uh, that was just an amazing introduction. Um, that was in 92 and um, came back to the U.S. and did a bunch of other freelance work, um, did some corporate design work for a startup and just a bunch of different things. And then came back to Imagineering in 97. And that's uh, around the time where... Uh, Jason and I met at the studios and uh, I was hired there as the art director for that park and uh, had the privilege of doing that for eight years, which was an amazing way to start your career uh, in this business. Uh, because I, you know, you hear so many great stories of, of uh, like George Caligridis and others who started, you know, their jobs uh, while they were in university scooping ice cream on Main Street, you know, so they had this base understanding of the parks and how they work and the business. And I didn't have any of that. So working at the studios park was great because in Florida, Imagineering is really embedded with the all of the operations businesses. So therefore, you really learn who your um, who your audience is, right? And uh, so that was a fantastic uh, lesson and a way to kind of cut my teeth in the industry and understand it from a design perspective. And working at the studios at that particular period of time was amazing. I mean, rock and roller coaster, fantastic. We re reprofiled Tower of Terror. I, I don't know how many times, four times. Uh, it seems like I was always in Tower overnight. And almost uh, died in the process. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. All, you work all night and you work all day. That's That was the way that it was. And one of the really most fun things that we had done when we were at the studios, um, I thought, was we really opened up a pipeline to the production facilities, uh, Disney's production facilities in Hollywood. So one of the things that Jason mentioned was creating these great uh, sets and uh, immersive kind of adventures for guests to partake of, which really brought them into the world of film. And, and there's probably too many to list, but uh, that was a real blast. In 2006, I was invited back to France uh, where I built Tower of Terror and um, Hollywood Boulevard and that whole entire, uh, it was almost like a little mini land there and the Stitch attraction translated into five languages. Woohoo! Um, so that was amazing. Wow. Uh, two years there working in another culture, learning how to tell stories that are relevant to another culture, even though it's Western Europe and most of us as Americans really believe that there's you know, uh, a, a lot of similar similarity between the two, and there is, mm -hmm. but there's still um, cultural differences you have to take into effect. And then from Paris, uh, I went straight to Hong Kong in 2008 and uh, worked there for four years. And uh, when I landed, the park was literally three years old and had to build an entire uh, studio, basically for Imagineering to work with the the local government with the local operations team and literally train the first generation of Chinese to understand how to visit the property, how to um, interpret the stories. And then on the other side of that invisible line was all of the Chinese and Hong Kongese who were working in the park, maintaining the park, creating new 
uh, product, uh, all of them really needed to understand how to do that as well. So it was a really cool opportunity. I was able to bring Imaginations Asia uh, to um, Asia, to Hong Kong. It's been going strong for about eight years. Um, working in all the different universities and really identifying key talent that could work in themed entertainment. That's now since gone on to Shanghai uh, to to uh, make sure that you have a deep pool of resources to kind of uh, resort to when you're hiring. Um, so I'm super proud of that work because um, previous to that, there was just a culture uh, specifically in Hong Kong and China in general that, you know, art was something that you did when you weren't good at anything else, right? Mm. Dancing, playing music, you know, painting. Those are great and, you know, do them in school. But when you get out, get into banking and science and, you know, yeah. those are the, the at the time that was the culture and there was really a shift happening. So f- to be a part of Disney and to be a part of Imagineering and to kind of bring that shift to the city, uh, to the country was, was super cool. I really enjoyed that. Um, after Hong Kong, uh, that was a doctorate level learning on storytelling. Um, you could never replace uh, that kind of learning. And of course, we expanded the park. We just did so much uh, in the four years that I was there. Um, I repatriated to the U.S. on a Friday. Um, and then on a Monday was my first job, uh, first day on my new job, which was Disney Springs. I made some business trips, but you know, you kind of lose a lot when you're flying 24 hours just in one direction. Uh, Jason, I'm sure remembers that from Beijing. It's a, it's a, it's a meat grinder. So my first day on the job was Monday. You know, some people say you should be happy they gave you the weekend to recover from your uh, six year overseas assignment. Um, and then uh, I always tell the story that I was so excited because that, that evening, Monday, we were flying to LA, our corporate headquarters for Imagineering uh, in uh, Glendale. And I was really excited because Tuesday was a big executive review, right? Big, you know, everybody was there, all of the, you know, John Lasseter. I mean, everybody was there. Um, and then on the plane over, of uh, trip over, I I was telling my friend, Dave Stofsick, uh, I'm so excited to kind of get all this information. He says, no, you don't understand. You're presenting. You know, it's like a day one and a half oh, wow. on the job. And, you know, I got to put on my dancing shoes in front of the corporate brass. So uh, it, I guess it went good. I, I didn't get fired uh, and went on to complete Disney Springs, uh, which Jason and I were able to partner on in the early days. Uh, super cool, extremely difficult, probably one of the hardest projects of my life uh, there, but uh, but learned an immense amount. And then finally, the last four and a half years of my life uh, with Imagineering was with Disney Cruise Line. And uh, super cool, very exciting to be hired as a portfolio uh, VP over that, uh, something like $5 billion portfolio, new islands, new ships. You know, at that time, they had decided to do a a dry dock every year on the ships. So what was really cool about that is it was constantly refreshing uh, the product there. And then um, the week of Christmas, I got my, my sailing orders uh, that, uh, you know, my time in Imagineering was over. Um, but what was really cool is it gave me the opportunity to start my own company, the Designers Creative Studio. And that's it's been a blast, uh, a lot of fun. And having um, my my freedom to do a lot of different things has been has been really exciting. And this is one of them. So I'm happy about it. Well, thanks. Thanks for being with us. And uh, we appreciate your your partnership with our program uh, as well. So, um, Nate, um yeah, we'd love to hear yeah your background, your story. Obviously, and, and you bring an incredible uh, asset to the industry through ThemeAttraction.com, um, where you felt like there was a real need for uh, a resource, a website like this um, in the industry. So I'd love to hear your story. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so with ThemeAttraction.com, I was uh, sort of bitten by the bug. A, a buddy of mine got a job at the Disney College Program uh, in the mid early mid nineties. And, uh, and so I actually flew out to Washington State <clears throat> from University of Colorado because uh, they did an interview there to go get a job at Disneyland. And I ended up on the Jungle Cruise. And uh, at that point, uh, so Jason, you and I have both been on the Jungle Cruise. I, I was able to do both of them, Disneyland and Disney World, which was great. <laughs> I thought Funny I heard some similarity there. Yeah. yeah. The only thing about that is that there's jokes in, in California that do not work in Florida and vice versa. No one would know that, you know. But, but it's there's a, a cultural difference there and it's just it's interesting but but um so yeah so I you know nowadays everyone's coming up through art school and I think the, the thing about 
the way we all came up was that there was no way to sort of break into the industry. And the way I best heard it described was there's a wall, there's like a 15 foot wall and there's people on the inside of the wall and there's a people, people on the outside of the wall wanting to get in and there's no door. But what happens is that every once in a while, there's a hole that will open up in that wall and it will suck somebody in. And then you're on the inside and, and that door, that wall closes up, the, the hole closes up and uh, it'll never open up in the same place again. And, and that's networking. And so we all really had to sort of wiggle and push and and network uh, our tails off in order to get into the industry. And so um, and that's that's good. But so some of those skills that I think uh, are, are picked up are, are valuable because none of us would have been successful had we not been able to do that. Um, now, there's a lot more opportunities with the, you know, the TEA and and uh, some of these next gen programs and things like that. So, and, and what you're doing, Chris, is great uh, with your program at IUPUI. Um, but anyway, getting back to it. So, I, I started out um, wanting to uh, write a paper on Haunted Mansion, and we had this brand new thing called Yahoo and a brand new computer lab. And there was, ab- I typed in Walt Disney Imagineering, nothing came up. And I typed in Haunted Mansion, I found one website reference, that was it. And So uh, I I basically made up from my memory as a 12 year old, this paper. And my thought was, okay, I got to get this done. Number two, I am, you know, completely obsessed with, you know, how Disney attractions are put together. Um, And the other thing is they can't fact check me because I know for a fact that there's nothing out there on the internet. So when I got done with college, I put together and bought themed attraction.com and uh, basically did put everything on there that I possibly you know, would know about uh, Disney theme park design from working in the parks. And uh, and so it wasn't through art school. It was through uh, watching how people move, how people, you know, stand in line, things like that. And, and that was intensely valuable. Um, and, and it really helped me actually, as you know, when I became a designer, I was actually able to sort of describe to my bosses a lot of times how you could make a, an attraction pulse, how how a queue would work just by by being in there. And um, it was interesting. A lot of the guys who come through, you know, one of my bosses at Universal Creative was an art director from Hallmark Channel. He had no idea. And I said, look, you can do it this way and you can do it that way. And so that was really valuable. I think that's, that's really sort of tagging on to what Aaron said, just working in the park and even, you know, sort of telling people where the bathroom is. Uh, it, it's just a, it's a wonderfully therapeutic thing to sort of help make somebody's day, but it also just really understands, uh, helps you understand what, um, what makes people mad and what makes them happy and what you can, what you can really do to, uh, to change their day around. So in any case, um, after, after college, I started calling myself a theme park designer, not knowing anything. I discovered IAPA, uh, TEA through mere chance. One of the things I think is important to, to recognize, you know, there's people out there who think, okay, Universal Creative, Walt Disney Imagineering, that's that's all there is. And uh, and if I don't get in there, then I'm, you know, uh, uh, my career's over. I'm, I haven't made it or, or, you know, one of those, you know, sort of uh, disappointments, I guess, that we can have in life. But in my case, I actually found a couple places, iTech Productions, and they also call themselves iTech Entertainment, and uh, Universal Art and Design, which were wonderful places to work that we did amazing, wonderful work. Um, and uh, and it just so happens that, you know, I had this experience where it's like, and, and I ended up at Universal Creative as well. That ended up being so corporate, uh, and it was it was wonderful, of course. But uh, but those two places were so much like family that that I just I, I want to um, sort of emphasize to the people who are listening that there are thousands of great companies out there, really hundreds. But uh, the ones that that are former Imagineers who create their own design shop and they're doing really great, wonderful work all across the world. And uh, and so if you find yourself as one of those folks who sends a resume off and it gets lost in the shuffle. Um, there's definitely a place for you in the industry and don't give up because they're wonderful, amazing places. So, um, so I went, uh, out of college, uh, to a place called uh, Richard Crane Productions and uh, Richard Crane had worked on Universal Studios, Florida, larger than life character, just a really great guy. 
And he would design, you know, sort of knockoff attractions, uh, Pirates of the Caribbean, and he would put it in Italy and call it something almost like Pirates of the Caribbean, you know. And we were doing all this this work in China, and, and we would basically have, you know, knockoff. It was like the earthquake attraction from Universal Studios uh, Florida and, and then the Jurassic Park. I mean, he would sell these attractions as sort of, you know, um, I, I don't know what you would call I, I yeah, they're knockoffs. And uh, well, they say course, copy is the they, greatest form of flattery. Well, and, and especially yeah, in the uh, in the yeah. Asian cultures, they don't have that same totally. sort of, um, you know, intellectual property uh, ideas that we do. They feel that that stealing is not only is that good business practice. And I, I, I say that in a nice way. Um, but also, it's it is uh, a, a form of of complementing what you've done. That that we're willing to take this idea and, and make it our own. Also, I think so, Disney legal would disagree. But they they may <laughs> they may have something to say. Yeah. But but he would do his own attractions, yeah. and uh, and so that was a wonderful thing. Um, that came to an end when um, his he just ran out of money. Um, but I was able to go uh, over to iTech Productions and work under Jeff Burton and Bill Cohen and. Jeff was a fantastic mentor to me. He was a former Imagineer and uh, worked on Epcot, MGM Studios, and really taught us, me, all of, you know, sort of that Imagineering process. And that's how we sort of thought our, uh, of ourselves as Imagineers for the rest of the world. So we did a lot of concepts. Uh, when you're not, you know, when you don't have unlimited buzz budgets like Disney or Universal, um, there's a lot of concepts that happen that, that there's not enough dollars to fund all the concepts. So you do a lot of them and they go and try to sell them and a lot of them just don't happen. Um, but it was a great sort of intellectual experience because we were able to do some neat things. We did do uh, the Holy Land experience, which was well in Orlando. That got a lot of negative press just for a lot of reasons. But what was great about that from a design point of view was that it was basically another Epcot World Showcase pavilion. So, you know, it, and because Jeff was the project manager on four of those, you know, Norway and, and Mexico and Morocco. So he said, we're going to make Israel an Epcot uh, World Showcase pavilion. And that's about how, how much budget they had. And so we did the best sort of recreation of a, of, of a World Showcase pavilion that was for or for these folks, the, uh, the folks who ran Holy Land Experience, and ended up being a really, really interesting project. So um, from there, um, they sort of uh, went through a, a huge downsizing after the dot-com bubble in 2001. And uh, I found myself over at Art and Design at Universal. And that was just one of those great, great uh, places to work. Everyone was family. And uh, TJ Manorino was fantastic. They did, and, and and here's what's great about art and design. I want, I want people to understand this. They did, you know, if you go to, to you know, WDI, you're going to spend two to five years working on an attraction. We did eight complete haunted houses in, you know, eight months. And what was great about that was that we could, you know, there was, it was like instant feedback. So, we would go through and, and do a house and and then we would be able to measure the results and, and see what the guest feedback was right away. And just, you know, okay, next year, we're not going to do that again. That didn't work. But sometimes we would literally say that house was great. And here are some elements that worked really well in this house. Let's take it over and, and put it in, in this new house from, you know, from day one. So, or, or for the, for the following year. So, um, so art and design was absolutely fantastic as sort of this test bed for a uh, good attraction design. You could just throw it away. There was sort of this, this uh, you know, um, this ability to to just experiment because you knew that it was only going to be going from the end of September until you know early part of November, and so it was it was really great. Uh, and then from there, uh, went and, and worked on several Universal Creative projects, um, Universal Studios Shanghai was a project we were on one of the lands over there and that was a lot of fun um we did uh worked on a roller coaster and i just remember we're on this massive model of you know it was probably 60 feet by 40 uh the first model that was put together of the park and i'm, I'm up there in my socks with the art director and we're putting the, the roller coaster that we're working on you know to three dimensions for the very first time no cat it was just literally we're bending hanger wire hanger wire up there and uh, and I thought, man, I'm getting paid, you know, to the bank to bend 
hanger wire and, and say, I think we need another dip here, you know? So that was, that was just mm -hmm. tremendous and fun. Um, and then I think I ended up uh, working on disaster studios, which was the, uh, the redo of the earthquake before they put in Harry Potter. So that was the last thing. So um, transitioning to uh, themed attraction.com. What's great about that is that, you know, it's, it's one of those places where, you know, you can, you can uh, actually reach out. It's now a social network. You can create a profile and you can reach out to guys like Aaron and myself and, uh, and, and really sort of, you know, you have access to um, the people who make the theme park attractions. Um, but then beyond that, there's also this ability now that we've created to self publish. So there's a lot of, you know, <laughs> I always say that there, there's a, there's all these people, it, you know, willing to write about the latest churro on, on Main Street USA. At Disney. Right. There's plenty of those. Yeah. There, and, yeah. and, but there's all these great companies like Sally Corporation that makes, you know, dark rides and, and they're doing really cool stuff. And, you know, no one's talking about them. And so that's where that company can come and talk and write about what they, what they are doing with, you know, in the world. And, and they can do that without, without cost. They can self publish. So it's a really powerful, neat platform. And, and that's kind of something that we've been working on for years and years. And uh, it's been a kind of a, a work of love, but that's, that's kind of been my focus right now. Well, and that, that website's been such a benefit to our students as well. I mean, the, the podcast that, that you do in partnership with Storyline Studios, but then also the website, um, it provides a really good resource for them. So we're, we're really appreciative of that. Um, and I like that you mentioned the uh, smaller guys out there too. Um, our first grad um, actually just got accepted to work over at Life Formations, which is just down the road from us down in Cincinnati. So there's a lot of really, as you were saying, there's a lot of really cool companies out there that people can work for. And you don't even have to be in Orlando necessarily. Yeah. Yeah never been more true for me. It's like it, a lot of what uh, Nate said really hit me personally because, and I'm sure Theron can relate because uh, up until COVID, you know, I'd spent close to 30 years on staff at one of those companies or the other. And when you're suddenly released into the wild, you know, you have, there's identity crisis issues like, well, if I'm not doing this, who am I? And right. uh, so to, to discover a place like Storyland where I now have the opportunity to do some of the most compelling work of my career. It's, it's living proof of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, oh, and just to chime in on a little bit on the art and design thing. Uh, you know, I got my start at universal entertainment. I was part of the, the team that, that created Halloween Horror Nights. And it's been a joy to see th that whole phenomenon, you know, become what it did. And that department is second to none in terms of creating film quality sets, you know, with which to stage these things, uh, along with compelling original stories and, and sort of amazing adaptations of, of classic horror IP. So it's, it's really well, been cool to see that journey. And, and if I could, you know, I was always really turned off, especially at first by some of the gore and, um, and some of the horror aspects of it. That's just not my character, as it were. Um, but what I realized working there is that people have the sort of, you know, Eddie Sato's line was always fear minus death equals fun, right? Um, and so, you know, people have the need almost, it's it's like, you know, the, the fear of sharks, right? Uh, it's the same thing that people have, you know, to be able to sort of face death and, and you know, face, you know, the, the a murderer or something extremely scary, a haunted house, which is really a, sort of an iconic thing. It can go through there, face that fear, and then and make it out alive on the other end. And you just sort of have this catharsis when you're done. It's like, ooh, that was great. And that's fun for people. And uh, and I think it's tremendously liberating. So that's that's a really sort of positive thing about, you know, that comes uh, through their work. So, you know, Nate, you had actually talked a little bit about this idea of uh, being kind of an imagineer for the world. And I think, you know, specifically uh, obsessed show, you know, is, is a, a podcast that is geared towards an audience for designers, right? So there's probably um, multiple designers out there that, that might not have even have thought that, oh, themed entertainment is a place that I can actually work and engage with. And so I think one thing I want to make sure that we really hit on is the breadth of the industry. 
and what the opportunities are that actually lie um, and, and that are out there for those that are in, you know, graphic design or creative work that might not be thinking that themed entertainment actually is a venue that they that they could they could um, cut their teeth on, right? So, tell me a little bit more about about some of the breadth or some of the opportunities that you've seen out there. Um, because I feel, I feel like in some ways the industry has, has continued to grow. Like initially it was thought to be just the theme park or just the land or just the dark ride, but we're seeing uh, kind of an expansion of that with the experience economy. So and anybody, any of you can take that. So like well, for me that what you just said was kind of the central preoccupation of my life at one point, because as a kid, I was always a Disney Kid, and I dreamed of being an Imagineer, but for the longest time uh, in, in my youth, I thought it's just not an option because I'm not an artist, an architect, or an engineer. And then it was through my early experiences, uh, specifically working with uh, the, the man who would become my mentor and kind of uh, my lucky charm for 30 years, Mike West, uh, who made me realize that as a writer, and then shortly thereafter as a director, I had just as much to continue uh, contribute to the art of theme design as an artist, an architect, uh, or an engineer. But uh, one of the main reasons I left Imagineering for Universal was because at the time, there did seem to be this bias toward the visual arts, which hurt me mm. as, as a writer. Um, now I think we, we have more of a, an understanding that there are, I think anyone, just speaking for my own role, can evolve into a creative director. But for the most part, I've seen they either come from the, the art side, you know, art director, concept designer, or the story and writing side. You know, and if you look at Imagineering, you just look at people like Marty Sklar, Tom Fitzgerald, Kevin Rafferty, uh, folks who have ascended to the highest ranks of the industry who were writers, at least to begin with. Um, and that was one of the main reasons I, I left for Universal, because uh, I was actually told at one point, oh, well, I don't think you could be a creative director because you don't draw. So the, and, and the funny thing was that kind of set a little fire under me because I'm kind of like, well, I'll show you, you know, and and that was why uh, going to Universal was such a, a blessing for me because I went over there to do the Fallon ride and literally within a year, they came to me and said, OK, we need you to, uh, to take on Beijing because it, it really needs help. And I'm like, OK, wh what attraction? What, you know, what, what land? And they're like, no, the whole thing. <laughs> All of it. Yeah. And I almost passed out because I'm like, oh, wow. I it just coming from where I've come from in my journey. I just never thought that would happen. So it, it really was a testament to me that no matter what discipline you start in, you can evolve into whatever you want to be. I, I'm living proof of that. And in Imagineering, as Theron well knows, we, we would always say there's 140, 150 some disciplines under this one roof. So literally almost any job you could have in the real world has some kind of imaginary equivalent. Um, but what we would always tell people uh, when speaking at colleges or, you know, uh, with fans, you know, I would always say, try to find something that you're really good at. So in my case, it was writing and match it to what you have a passion for. And if you can unite those two things, you really have a shot. Because another thing you hear in this business a lot is, oh, well, I'm an idea person. I have a lot of great ideas. And it's like, okay, well, you also have to have a way to communicate right. those people, whether it's right. with a typewriter. I'm saying that for effect because there are no typewriters. Sure, right. Yeah. <laughs> a pen, a pencil, a paintbrush, uh, computer programs, graphic designer, choreographer, actor, costume designer, whatever it is, you need to have a way to communicate your passion and your vision. And for me, at least, and I think for a lot of people, that's how I found my path into the industry. And Nate's right. It's like there, there's never been more opportunity than there is now. And uh, as Theron and I have recently discovered, there's also infinite possibilities out there beyond the big two. And, and they're all doing compelling work. And especially with the evolution into experience design, and I'm discovering this firsthand at Storyland, we have the opportunity now to almost go beyond theme parks and really impact and enhance the quality of life for people in their communities. And that was something you know that Walt was doing at the very end with with Epcot. He was more interested in urban planning and remaking the urban experience than he was the Magic Kingdom at Walt Disney World. He could have cared less. He was focused on the idea of Epcot, and I think the idea of Epcot, even though the the park evolved into something else, sure. the idea of Epcot has actually disseminated out into the world now yeah. through all of these other companies. 
Yeah, that was the point I was going to hop on to is we talked a lot about the number of uh, professions uh, would give you multiple entrances into the themed entertainment industry, which is broad and deep and wide and a massive, massive industry. Almost any profession you could think of has a role within the themed entertainment industry. But here's the really cool thing is that once you've spent time within the themed entertainment industry and you've really mastered this idea of uh, taking a brand, using a story to deliver that brand into an experience to a, an audience or to a consumer. Once you've really done that well and preferably done it in a lot of different ways, right? The same process is applied to attractions and parks and hotels, RD&E ships. The same processes is different ways to express them. But uh, it's the same process, the same result, making an emotional connection with a with a consumer, with a guest. Once you've done that, you can do that anywhere. You can do that in any market, right? Name a market that doesn't need a stronger connection between its audience and its product. And, and I'll tell you, a market that's not going to succeed, right? And you can look at Sears and Toys R Us and other, you know, big box retailers that don't exist anymore because they didn't conform. Blockbuster, right? I mean, there's a whole long list graveyard of, unfortunately, of companies and brands that that didn't pivot, that didn't turn. And I really think, and Jason hit the nail on the head, is that anybody that's worked in this industry for any time can go into the world and impact other markets in a significant way. Look at Joe Rohde, recently retired, and in his next move, he couldn't even be confined to the planet. You know, he had to go out <laughs> into space. Right. I was saying, right. like, that, that was short lived. Right. Testament to the influence of the art of theme design. And yeah. uh, again, there's, th- you know, as Nate said, there's hundreds, however many companies now. Uh, but it, it can all be traced back to That's Walt right. Disney and and his initial vision for wanting to impact the lives of his audience in new and different and compelling ways. And then by the end of his life, he wasn't even content with movies, TV, and theme parks. He's like, no, I, I want to help people live better. And to Theron's point, companies that adopt that philosophy and you know the the, the emerging notion of experience design is the best example of that. Um, it hit me when I first moved down here in 91, because uh, coincidentally, the cover story of Time Magazine that week said Orlando. And it had a, I'll never forget, it had a picture of the dinosaur Gertie ice cream uh, stand <laughs> from uh, Disney's, Disney MGM Studios on the cover at, at sunset. But the whole point of the article was how the principles of theme design were now seeping into other areas of life. And you started to see it with sort of festival marketplaces, which have, are starting have started to replace malls, urban planning. Uh, they mentioned the Orlando airport. When you're driving out of the airport, you're, you're driving through lushly landscaped uh, views, which just was never the case before. So you yeah. can, and that was- A real arrival sequence for yeah. Orlando, right? Think of brands like, I always use the example of Lululemon, right? They started off making athletic wear primarily for uh, females, right? Then that branched into athletic wear for the entire family. Now stores themselves feature yoga and Pilates in the store. So, I mean, talk about a lifestyle brand. That's not bubbly water and syrup in a bottle. That's not really lifestyle, even though it's marketed that way. Um, This is real lifestyle. You you buy your workout gear and you actually perform right there in the store what the clothes were designed for. I mean, that that is so cool. And you see that now happening in so many different ways, right? Restaurateurs. I mean, look at Disney Springs, right? Five, six James Beard award-winning chefs. There's no other place in the United States that has that collection of real chefs right there in in the on the premises, right? You know, cooking and visiting. And I mean, it's just really cool to see that's... That is, I think, a, a way to look at the outworkings of what we're talking about here is that it's it's really bringing story to life, really bringing experience to life, and really putting brands in touch with their audiences in a way that we haven't really seen in the in the previous 50 years, right? That I think that's significant. And as Jason said, that's down to Walt, um, bringing that to the world. And businesses that adopt that are successful. Businesses that don't are less successful or not successful. And it's it's interesting because along those same lines, uh, I, I think of this is going to seem like a really weird example, but the shirt I'm wearing 
is from Bill Murray, of all people, who, who went from like a, a Saturday Night Live fixture to beloved actor to now kind of lifestyle brand. You know, and it's, you know, he's kind of like one of those select few, like a Jeff Goldblum or a William Shatner or some of these uh, uh, personalities who have now become sort of characters unto themselves and just branch out into people's lives in different ways. Or I think of uh, one of my friends from the Star Wars world, Ashley Eckstein, who uh, started out as the voice of Ahsoka Tano on The Clone Wars. And she looked around and said, you know what? Females aren't represented properly in the world of fandom. Everything's geared to guys or specifically young boys. So she started her own company called Her Universe, which was dedicated to fashion for the fangirl. And then in recent years, she wound up selling the company to Hot Topic. It was that successful and it become that much a part of the, the fandom's collective lives. Uh, and then she ultimately expanded that into our universe because a lot of guys, myself included, looked at some of the stuff she was designing saying, wait a minute, I, I would wear that. I mean, I basically designed a Walking Dead hoodie for her like 10, 12 years ago. And I'm like, but I, I want this. It's cool. You know, because it was like a gray hoodie that would zip up and it said, don't open dead inside, you know, from that classic shot from the show. Then when you <laughs> unzip the hoodie, the, the lining inside was like all these zombies coming at you. I'm like, well, I want that. And she goes, well, uh, well, I can have them make a 4XL in women's and maybe you can wear that. <laughs> It'll work. You know, but it just shows how people uh, who have that vision can pivot. And, and translate their product, if you will, whether you're an individual or a company, uh, into new areas that allow you to connect with your audience differently. You know, to, to kind of that point about pivoting, you know, because I've sat and I've had conversations with museum curators, you know, and, and directors. And, uh, you know, obviously, you know, Theron, you talked this idea of, of needing to adapt, right? And how we've had those in the our economy that have not adapted and they've not pivoted. So therefore they've collapsed. What, what does a company need to do? You know, what do they need to consider? What mindsets do they might, they might need to, to undertake um, to, to pivot, to adapt? Um, Cause obviously we're seeing Walt's influence in many other places right now but obviously some are probably still not realizing that. So, well, I, I would just answer by saying, you know, I took what Walt and other Zieg Ziegler said serious, right? It's uh, walk in your guest shoes, understand your audience, right? That's before you get up to give a speech, uh, before you commit hundreds of millions of dollars to producing an experience, you really need to know your audience. And and Walt knew his audience in, incredibly well. I mean, think about the first full length animated feature film, right? I mean, if you look at Snow White, there are so many firsts, stereophonic sound. I mean, first time that uh, products were released at the same time as the movie. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. He knew his audience in a Steve Jobs kind of way, right? None of us you know, knew that we needed uh, an iPhone, a smartphone, a super cray supercomputer in our hands. But Jobs did. He knew it. He pushed for it. He made it happen. And I, I think that's what is so critical about um, business today is you have to not only know your audience, you have to see trends, you have to put them together, and you have to predict where people are going. And, and you have to do that in a way that's authentic, that's real. It can't be fake. It can't be fluff. Humans have an innate ability to smell poop, you know, miles away. They, they just do. And if you're, if you're disingenuous, people know it, you know, it doesn't matter how big your smile or how white your teeth, people can smell a fraud. And so I think that, that, you know, now more than ever, when people have been confined in their homes. I mean, you look at certain countries, they're still on lockdown. I mean, the UK, yeah. nobody's gone outside, right? I mean, it's locked down. And uh, the only way that companies can reach out is to really understand the new mindset that people will have when they're when they're coming out of their homes and into the world, right? And I think the companies that understand their audience, the changes that culture goes through and stays um, lean and nimble and is able to uh, meet their guests and their audience right where they are. I think those are the successful, the successful brands. Walt was the first to pivot when you think about it, because everything that scared the socks off the rest of the industry, he ran into. 
Because believe it or not, there was a resistance to sound. Uh, you know, other studios thought it was a fad. It would go away. And Walt was like, no, I'm OK, we're going to stop what we're doing. And we're going to make our, our, our Mickey cartoons with sound from the get go. Uh, and then, you know, Theron mentioned the first animated feature. They said he was crazy. Um, stereophonic sound, Fantasia. He wanted to install these expensive sound systems. And people said he was crazy. Now you can do that in your house. The big one was television. Every other studio head was, oh, the sky is falling. This is going to be the end of us. And Walt was like, I'm going to have my own show and I'm going to use it to fire up all these other uh, areas of the company. And then he created synergy from that. So it, it, I, I love to think what well, makes me sad, but I love to think about what Walt would have done with home video, you know, yeah. VHS, then DVD, then Blu-ray, then streaming. Yeah. Uh, yeah. because uh, everything that's been resisted because Hollywood resisted home video as well, you know, and, the, and uh, Disney was among the first to say, well, no, this can be a new business for us. And now we're releasing feature length movies, right? Streaming, yeah. right. Plus, and it's proven itself time and again. Now you're seeing this back and forth between the studios and exhibition because of, of what streaming has done. And certainly, uh, you know, everyone talks about what pan the pandemic has done. In, in entertainment, I think it's just expedited trends that were already well on their way. We were always going to get to a point, like I personally would love to get to a point where on a Friday, I can go to, the, to my local theater and see the latest Marvel or Star Wars movie on the biggest screen I can find with the greatest sound system I can find, and then go home to find the Blu-ray sitting in an Amazon package on my doorstep, or I can fire it up on Disney+. Plus. That's where we're headed. And we were always headed to that. But the pandemic has just cranked up the timeline a little bit. But you can see the growing pains because the exhibitors are like, you're trying to put us out of business. And it's like, well, no, it, we're ultimately going to find what that balance is. Just like television didn't put movies out of business. The pandemic's not going to put movies out of business and streaming's not going to put. And when I say movies, I mean the theatrical experience. Mm -hmm. It's Isn't that the same going to settle again into a new paradigm. It's so true. Isn't that the same with theme parks, right? I have had so many students and people that have asked, you know, do you think the theme park is dead? Do you no. think that it, it, and I'm like, what are you crazy? I have Hundreds no patience for that kind of thing. Cause it's, no it's all, the, and I'm not trying to minimize the impact of the pandemic because there right. was a huge loss of life. It was a tragic event for the entire planet, but people who are so quick to declare the end of something just yeah. drive me crazy. If you think the Broadway show is dead, the, the the Sunday ball game is dead or the uh, trip to a theme park is dead. You're, you're just, you're out of your mind. You don't know your audience. I'll just yeah. go back to what I started with, right? Escapism and play are two massive components in the human condition, right? We, ha we need to escape. We need, we need to play. Need. Yeah. And everything that you just mentioned or that we've been talking about are avenues for escapism and play, right? You can look back all through history and no matter how bad it got, you still spend a nickel on a Laurel and Hardy movie, right? Yeah. Well, and, and to your point there, and like it's it's something that's physical, physical and tangible. I mean, I'm sure there's some that believe that, if, well, I can put a VR headset on and get that same experience. It's not the same, right? I'm not doing it with my Right. You know, my spouse or my kids or someone else who's next to me actually engaging in that with me. Right. It's 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 a completely different thing. Yeah. You cannot feel the movement of flight of passage at home. Right. If you strapped on a, one of the, you know, bricks on your face at home, as good as they are, it's a brick on your face. Right. And, and you're in your living room, even if your kids turn a fan on and blow. It's just it's not the same and, and no shade on what the technology is because it's super cool. And, it's and if you look at the gaming industry just for the past year, year and a half, I mean, that that curve is like this hundreds of billions of dollars what we're missing and this is a whole nother topic what we're missing is the company that's going to connect the two right way back in the way back machine jason and i pitched an idea that would actually do that where it would connect a physical on-site experience with a virtual uh, experience. So think open world like Fortnite, you know, something that's just massive, you know, the, the company that figures out a way to connect those two so that your at home experience and your um, adventure experience where you travel to go, your physical brick and mortar experience, they're tied together and that those things learn from each other. And the common denominator is you, right? The, the company that learns how to do that and that spends the money in that, that's that to me is the future. 
Yeah, and it could be done to your point. Mm-hmm. I forgot about that there, and that was two. It could have been done fifteen years ago. Five, yeah, uh, and it would it would have been an amazing attraction. And here's the thing: you could do that tomorrow yeah. if you write the check, and if yeah. you have the the vision to to realize that that uh, could be the, very well be or is the next step in the evolutionary process of this. Yeah. But you know, we we become so isolated, never more so now than with the pandemic. But yeah. I remember when I started uh, on the Fallon ride, you know, people were saying, all right, well, are you going to figure out, you know, it's a virtual line. So are you going to figure out how, how people can use their devices, you know, in the queue? And I'm like, no, no, I don't want people turning inward. They're going to do that anyway. I'm interested in doing as much as I can to turn everybody outward for a communal experience. And that's why we ended up with things like the Ragtime Gals performing live right there uh, in the queue or hashtag the panda. I, I, don't, I don't want people going more digital in the ultimate brick and mortar environments that we create. When I wonder, Jason, if we're gonna see more of that, more of the physical and less of the inward, specifically being in the midst of the pandemic right now, because we've hit a level of exhaustion. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's, that's my hope, right? But It's a rebound. Well, people have talked, there was on uh, the news last night, uh, there are all these parallels to the roaring 20s. That is absolutely going to happen again, where people are so, you know, it, instead of the end of World War I, it's the end of the pandemic. And even more so, like World War I, at least in this country, that was fought over there. So people were still living here. Mm-hmm. And yet you still had that release of stress and emotion. Now with the pandemic, you're talking about people literally finally being able to leave the house. So I, I absolutely believe there's going to be an almost unmanageable surge in demand yeah. for everything that this industry provides in all of its forms, film, sports, theme parks, concerts, theater, whatever. Yeah. We won't be able to keep up with demand. I personally hope the Roaring Twenties lingo comes back so we can talk <laughs> about it. We're going to do a new ride, see? And it's going to be swell. <laughs> <laughs> he, that guy's got moxie. <laughs> See, I really think that that what the companies that are really going to be sig- really see significant growth. This is just prediction on my part. Are the companies that didn't run and hide and throw a big rock over themselves, scrape all the Scrooge McDuck coins together in a pile and sit on it? I think the companies that took the opportunity to invest right now. And even a year ago, right, in what the future was going to be, those are the companies that are going to be standing. Those are the companies that are going to really be making bank. And that that's, that, you know, it's th- this type of event. You can go back and look, right? We have history to look and see what happened after 9-11, see what happened after 2008, right? You can see the companies that really pushed in. Those are the, the products that we use. Those are the experiences that we, we uh, go enjoy, and I, I fear that the legacy brands that we've been talking about, Disney, Universal, Merlin, the big folks, right, that, that can't afford to, to lose a lot of money, I, I think they take so long to pivot, right? And, mm-hmm. and you, we've seen that, right? Disney Plus, that's where all the capital is going, right? The capital is not going to new attractions, innovation. It's just not happening. But the smaller companies, right, the second tier down from them, those are the companies that are making investments. Now, it might be an off-the-shelf Zamperla ride, but it's maybe it's implemented in a new way with new technology. I think those those are uh, just prediction, but I think those are the companies that are really going to do well, projecting where audiences are going to be after the rebound. Everybody's going to want to go out and go to the beach. Everybody's going to want to go ride their favorite roller coaster, or their favorite ride, you know, get their favorite churro, whatever. That's that's a that's a rebound. It's a wave. That's not going to happen for very long. After that, there's going to be hunger for what's new, right? Yeah. What else did you do while you, everyone was at home? Is going to be the question, and and I'm anxious to see that too because I I don't know what companies are really investing and moving forward when everybody else is shrinking back. That's how I got my new job. You know, uh, this, my colleagues at Storyland, much like Walt, you was able to use the depression to uh, to build his animation studio. Uh, several Storyland folks have said to me, honestly, COVID was a blessing in disguise in terms of us being able to bring in talent that wouldn't have been available to us mm-hmm. otherwise. And, yeah. the, and the flip is true for me. I now have opportunities available to me that I wouldn't even have considered before unless this uh, transformational event had happened. 
and mm-hmm. make no mistake, no one is saying, oh, thank goodness for COVID. But, uh, you know, there is uh, there can be a silver lining if you don't succumb to Chicken Little syndrome. And, and because as Theron said, it happened with 9-11. It happened in 2008. I've been telling people that COVID is the biomedical equivalent of 9-11, where there's a very drastic and extreme short term response. And then the further and further we get away from it, you're going to see more and more of a return to normal. And just like 20 years, you know, 9-11 was 20 years ago this year. And yet I still get to the airport two hours ahead of time. You know, there's, yep. There are lingering effects of 9-11, you know, and mostly in the, in the realm of security, as it should be. Right. So 20 years from now, you may see more places that take your ch- temperature before you go in. You might see, you know, it used to be limited to some of the Asian countries. Now you're probably going to see more people Mass. from every country wearing masks on planes. Touchless but technology. Again, it's don't succumb to the sky is falling. Mm-hmm. I understand public companies have shareholders to answer to and there are cash flow issues and, and things of that nature. But if you can afford to keep your head, you know, you're the one that's going to come out ahead as Theron says, because I totally agree. After people said, OK, I got my pirates fix. What, what else you got for me? Right. And that, yeah. that should be good news. We should circle that. Sorry, to t- I don't want to take the job of the host, but we should circle that back to the, the people who are listening. Right. The, those design students, those professionals who are who are begging to make a, a pivot. That should be really good news for everybody that's listening. Right. That means that there's potential and even more markets for those storytellers, those dimensional uh, designers, those writers, those producers. Uh, I mean, there's, that should be really good news that a lot of other industries that are tangential or even parallel to themed entertainment will be hungry for what themed entertainment has done, right? And those who are experienced can take that message and that that um, life, if you will, into those other industries and markets. Well, yeah. And if I could tag onto that, I mean, what I've noticed in my career, you know, after Epcot was built in 1982, they laid off something like 2000 Imagineers. Um, and there was this huge tumult that happened. Uh, but a lot of these great companies like Landmark Entertainment, it was Landmark, uh, BRC Imagination Arts, iTech Productions, all came out of that. And then in 94, there was another turn down. I saw that because I was working at Disneyland. Uh, at the time, I was an intern also. Uh, And then in 2001, there was about, you know, we had the dot-com bubble, but there was also, you know, uh, six or seven theme parks that were created across the world that all got finished at the same time. Uh, Port Aventura, Spain, Animal Kingdom, Islands of Adventure. There was was a bunch of theme parks and everyone, you know, everyone downsized after that. And everyone was sort of pulling their hair out like, you know, what am I, what am I going to do next? Well, a lot of folks went and started companies and those companies are all surviving or uh, uh, some of them are surviving today. And the ones that sort of got their legs became the Falcons creative and in places like that. So yeah, it's not a bad thing when this happens, kind of the, the churning of the salad bowl is a good thing for, you know, for opportunity. We've seen it with Darren and we've seen it with Jason. Um, and and so if you're brand new into the industry, uh, this is a great time, actually, because everyone's sort of looking around like, oh, no, I, you know, I lost all these people. Now I need them back. Um, or, you know, hey, there's this company over here that's doing these things. And so so there's a lot of the, a lot of that happening right now. So great, great, great opportunity. So uh, take advantage of it is what I would say and look at it with a positive light. That's so the to kids, you know, because I just spoke with SCAD and UCF and, and part of one of the things the professors wanted me to cover was, you know, they want to know if there's still an industry to go into. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, are you kidding? You, you guys are the best positioned to take advantage of this because the storm is coming. The flood is coming and you're going to be able to catch that wave. Well, and I, you know, I think that's kind of been my thinking in that, well, you know, when we started our concentration and our certificate and and minor, we, you know, there's a part of me that was like, well, that was great timing because we got everything launched and then the pandemic hit. And then it was like, oh, we just kind of invested in an industry that have just gone to their knees. But the other side of me is gone. No, like the experience economy is going to blow up and there's going to be a real need for our students to engage with the industry 
and there's going to be positions for them. But but to that point, for both you know students, our students, and then also those who are currently in you know design as a graphic designer and or they're working for a creative firm. Um, last question, because I want to be respectful of our time. What, what you know? What other types of things do you do you think that someone needs to really engage with the industry? Because I think um, sometimes there there are those people that are like, well, I'm just a fan, right? You know, they they're a super fan, and so they think, well, because I'm a super fan, I you know, I'm I'm going to get have the opportunity to go work at Walt Disney Imagineering. So what what else do they need besides being a fan and maybe having some skills? Can I can I take this one? Um, you know, I think there's a, a big misconception here that um, people people believe uh, that I'm going to be the idea guy. I'm going to sit in a room and I'm going to think of these great ideas. And all these these ideas are, are worth a million dollars. You know, I, I have this idea. I'm going to present it to Disney and they are going to buy this idea. I'm going to be rich and I'm going to be that famous guy who thought of, you know, whatever it is. Um, I, I invented Pirates of the Caribbean. You know, but it doesn't work that way. Um, what happens is you get on a team and uh, if you're of one of, you know, probably seven or eight or 10 different disciplines, you'll sit in a room and really hash it out during Blue Sky for two or three days or however long the process takes. And then from there, you spend the next nine to 12 months, two years working on that, you know, ideas, grinding out what that, what that one day of work was. You know, and it's not it's not that there's just one good idea. There's there's hundreds of great ideas that you you mix together and and you toss some along the way. And it's like, well, this one no no longer makes sense anymore. So um, the idea of of being you know an Imagineer as the idea guy, I think, is is a misnomer. I think what you need to do is sort of like what Jason and Theron were saying. You have to have a skill. But the good news is that there's 140 different disciplines (laughs) Um, that you can do and you can be part of this process and it's pretty much all team. And, and by the way, I will say this, if you do work in a smaller company, the odds of you getting to do more of these things and being in on more of those sort of brainstorming sessions, the opportunities go up. Yeah. Um, yeah. So don't look at a uh, small company as a bad place. It's actually a good place. Absolutely. Getting started is the biggest thing. So I yeah. just, I'll tap into what uh, Nate was saying is I think the greatest skill any individual could possess, and that's that's at any discipline, category, any role, is the ability to listen and listen well. Because, you know, every job that you do in this industry, you're working for a client. That client runs a business, no matter how creative, no matter how big the story is, no matter if it's a universal and they're investing hundreds of millions or, or whether it's a Dollywood and that goes down to, you know, 40 million or something. Um, it doesn't matter. That's a client. You got to listen to your client. And conversely, what we've been talking about this whole time is listening to your audience. So I, that's my personal feeling. That's what I teach uh, students is listening. You've got to sit, listen to what is said around the table, listen to your team. You know, you may have had the idea that got all the everything started, but um, as Nate said, everybody else contributes. And if you're not listening, then the idea is not going to be um, modified and evolved into the, the very best product for the client or for the guests. I think Theron and I learned that firsthand by spending a, a decent amount of time in, in Imagineering's field offices, because like he mentioned earlier, you're living there at the park embedded with them. And, uh, you know, our, our, our mutual colleague and mentor, Mike West, always said, look, if this thing can't be operated, you know, and, and can't do what it's supposed to do on a daily basis, then you're, you're just spinning your wheels. So you really do need that partnership. And I, I totally agree that listening is key because there's always going to be somebody, you know, wh- whether it's your creative superior, the, your uh, operational partner or the audience itself, you've got to be respe- respectful of, of these, all of these different points of view and these different stakeholders so that you can create something that truly works for the, the audience that it was intended for. 
And I think about like uh, we listen to guest feedback for Disney Springs as a simple example. And one of the feedbacks was, um, you know, I, I don't it takes too it's too hard to park. So I don't I don't come. And there was just hundreds of, of comments from guests about that and that we summarized all of that as a design criteria that said to fix the arrival sequence. Well, did you know that after just that set of guest comments, the company collectively invested hundreds of millions of dollars to just fix that parking garages, highway expansions, interactive signs, you know, a connection from I-4, which took a government approval. I mean, literally just from just from that one thing, because we as you know, uh, as a team, but also the company listened to what was being said. And that's why um, they're now. Uh, above capacity in, in, at Disney Springs, even with even with the restrictions, right? Part, and parking structures are not a cheap date. Those are that's one of those things where the minute it's mentioned in a meeting, somebody's like, "Oh crap, parking garage!" <laughs> yeah. And exactly. Springs has like four of them now. That uh, to me, it goes back to wait for it, Walt Disney, where <laughs> they would have meet early uh, meetings after the opening of Disneyland, and and you'd have folks in the park going, "Well, the guests are trampling through the flower bed over here." And they, they won't stop or they're cutting through there. And then Walt would say, instead of putting up a fence, put a path. Because obviously people want to do that. So instead of putting up a barrier to keep them out, pave it, you know, and, and create a path. <laughs> Listen, you know, these are on these are uh, living organisms. And that's kind of the beauty of it. They can evolve and change. Well, um, I, I could sit and talk with you guys for a couple more hours to be honest with you um my and yet i also disagree. what's that jason my wife would disagree with you yeah i know you. mine mine would too um and so yeah i but i really i'm really really thankful for each of your time uh i'm really thankful for what you have contributed to the industry uh and for introducing this audience to the uh to the theme entertainment industry um and i want to I want to make sure that we give a quick final uh, moment for any shameless plugs, right? So, um, you know, Theron, um, you obviously run Designers Creative Studio. Um, there's some really good um, individual courses and master classes that you're putting up. Uh, and so I, I would encourage everyone to go that out. Obviously, themedattraction.com, go on there, make a profile. Um, and engage with the industry. It's a great place to go. You can go there. You can publish uh, yourself and, and get something on the front page. Uh, and then Jason, you know, check Jason out on uh, amazon.com. You can go to Jason Searle uh, and, and Google him. And there's um, some really good books up there. And obviously for us, if you're interested in engaging with the industry, consider uh, a certificate in themed entertainment. And you can check more about, uh, check on that at cgt.iupui.edu. Uh, and, um, yeah, we, we love to have you join us as we, we get to have, we get to do fun things like this. We get to talk to industry professionals and, uh, and it is an online certificate as well. So you can be anywhere, anywhere you're hearing this, you can join up with us. So, yeah. So, uh, any, any final words, anyone? No, if I can give an additional plug, uh, yeah. you know, uh, we're talking about Mike West, uh, Jason was. Uh, he's on the Themed Attraction podcast, did some really good things about uh, a year ago. And upcoming, we've got Jason Sorrell on the podcast. Uh, so stay tuned and check in. That will be that will be coming in. And uh, if we can get there, and we are uh, definitely going to try that too. Awesome. I would say that there's so many great, this is an example for uh, individuals who are interested in, you know, this as a lifestyle as a, cause it's, it's more than a job, right? It, it really is fun. If you're pursuing your passion and you're doing what you love and you're working with people that, you know, it, uh, are, are fun to work with and never before has there been so many resources available uh, and the community itself, the community, this themed entertainment community is really open and has really uh, reached out to talk with students, to encourage people, to to help in, in ways that I, I never even thought possible. So I've been blown away seeing what, what our community has done. And I, I, I really do think it's a quite an amazing time 
for uh, you to be a student or a young professional, a new person, the next generation moving in this direction, because there are so many opportunities that are some paid, some are pretty affordable, and uh, some are free uh, opportunities for you to learn. And um, I think that's really, really important. Everywhere that you can bridge the gap between your academia and boots on the ground, uh, I think you should take advantage of that. The only, the only thing I would say, and I'll use an industry term to say it, and it's kind of building on what Theron has said, but this would specifically be for students and young people regarding this industry. The, the sky is still blue and it is not falling. So stay, uh, keep at it because big, big things are coming. Nice. Well, thanks again, everyone. Uh, I really appreciate the time. And um, you, you all have, you know, all stay safe. Uh, for those of you who are in Florida, enjoy Florida. We are getting warmer here in Indianapolis and we'll take it. So <laughs> thanks, everyone. Nice. Thanks, thanks everybody. Thank take you. care. Okay, kids, that's episode 158 in the books. For all of today's show notes, head over to obsessedshow.com. And if you haven't already while you're there, add your email address to our newsletter. I'll update you on some of my favorite new episodes and some cool things I find in my daily obsessions. Of course, all the links are over at obsessedshow.com to all the places you can find this show, iTunes, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, SoundCloud, Google Play, and Spotify. So no matter where you find your podcasts, chances are you can listen to Obsessed Show from there. Just head over to obsessedshow.com. The Obsessed Show is produced by yours truly, Josh Miles. To have me speak or MC at your next event, head over to joshmiles.com to learn more. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.